Okay, we are live. Hello, welcome. Welcome, everyone. everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Catherine Turvey. Uh, I'm the coordinator at ICOM for Museum and Society. ICOM is the International Council of Museums, and um, in case some of you may not know, uh, it is the global uh, network for museum professionals. Uh, so we have a lecture for you today, and um, we can wait a few minutes before we start just to make sure that everyone who wanted to join uh, will will be able to connect and be online and not miss any of the great lecture that we have coming up. Uh, so maybe we can just wait a couple more minutes as people log on. Okay, so it's a couple minutes after four Paris time. So uh, maybe we can get started uh, with a little word about ICOM and then a couple notes about housekeeping before I present our speaker for today. Um, as I said earlier, ICOM is uh, the International Council of Museums. Uh, it is a network of over 50,000 members all over the world. It's a forum of experts uh, that works to establish professional and ethical standards in the museum field. Uh, it advocates for museums and raises awareness through uh, global network and cooperation programs. Uh, if you're here today at the webinar and you're not already a member of ICOM, you might consider reaching out to your national committee to get some more information about how to join. Uh, so just a quick note on housekeeping. Um, today we won't be doing a sort of multi-speaker panel like a lot of us have become used to uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, instead, we'll be taking a deep dive into a subject with just one specialist speaker as our guide. If you have any questions for our guest lecturer, I'll invite you to submit them uh, using the chat function, if you're on the UCOV platform, it will be to the right of uh, your video. And for those of you who are here on Zoom, I think you'll know where to find the, the, the chat function already. Uh, so it will be a lecture of about a half an hour. Uh, and then there will be a Q&A session at the end, and we'll try to address everybody's questions that come up in the various chats. Uh, finally, there is simultaneous interpretation today for our talk in both uh, French and Spanish. Uh, so you can find those on the platforms that you're using to listen to us. So without any further ado, I'm very excited today to present our lecturer. Sean Young is the manager and curator of collections and, and lab archaeology at Sachlindenna, Saving Things House, uh, the Haida Gwaii Museum. The museum is located on Haida Gwaii, the traditional territory of the Haida Nation, which is located on the Pacific coast of Turtle Island uh, in off what is now known as Canada. Sean will lead us through a virtual tour of the museum while showing us how the museum and the community have worked to decolonize their museum exhibits, metadata, archives, collections, conservation techniques, and the care and handling of cultural treasures. 
Again, if you would like to ask questions or make comments, please use the chat function and be as concise as you can. And we'll try to get to those once the presentation is over. So now I would like to hand it over to Sean and offer a starting hawa, thank you in the Haida language for joining us today. Uh, hello very much, Catherine. Uh, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my Haida name is Gidyak E. Uh, my English name is Sean Young. As Catherine said, I'm the collections manager at South Linda Nye Saving Things House, the Haida Gwai Museum. And I'd like to give you a little virtual tour, as Catherine said, about some of our indigenizing museum practices uh, at our museum. And to start, I'd like to give a little brief uh, history uh, about the Haida Gwai Museum. So the South Linda Nye Saving Things House, or the Haida Gwai Museum, is the result of one of the earliest, if not the earliest steps towards in Haida, we call Kuliara, which translates to making things right or uh, reconciliation in the world of indigenous peoples and museums. A vision of both Haidas and Canadians uh, residing on Haida Gwai, our society was formed in 1971, which at the time was called the Queen Charlotte Islands Museum Society. And the museum officially opened in 1976. South Linda Nye was the name given uh, to the museum by elders, community members, and the Skidigit Haida Immersion Program. The museum is governed by the longest living all island board on Haida Gwai. Our board is represented by all communities on Haida Gwai, both Haida and non Haida. Today, along with the Skidigat Band Council, Waihanas Parks Canada, we are a proud partner of the award-winning Haida, Haida Heritage Centre at Kayonagai, which you see here in this picture. Our museum's mandate is to promote understanding of all that Haida Gwai is, with a primary focus on all aspects of historic and contemporary Haida culture. We're also dedicated to support and presenting Haida Gwai's settler history and natural history, and to building capacity in the fields of arts and heritage. Almost 50 years ago, South Linda and I began with a small collection of Haida and settler works generously donated by local families. Uh, today, we are internationally recognized facility with an ever-growing collection of ancestral and contemporary treasures, including impressive representations of Ireland's natural world, an archive rich with history of Haida Gwai, and an exciting annual schedule of art exhibits and educational programs. So as Catherine stated, the Haida Gwai Museum is located uh, within the Haida Gwai Heritage Centre, which is right here, at Kayonagai. This was a dream of the Haida people uh, for decades. During the 1990s and early 2000s, framework groups led by Haida Gwai Museum staff, Parks Canada, Skidigat Band Council, elders, chiefs, and community members from all island communities met to help design and create this new center. Before any groundbreaking or disturbance of development sites, we were informed and directed by the Haida people to be cautious. The new Haida Heritage Center and the Haida Gwai Museum are located at Kayonagai, which is an ancient Haida village site which still has a clan and family representing them today. The center was designed to resemble the traditional ocean, Oceanside Haida village that once stood in place. The first phase of this massive project was raising six frontal poles over six days during the summer of 2001, which you could see here in the background.
This is to, to show everyone the location of Haida Gwaii as it sits in regards to Canada and North America, as the Haida is called Turtle Island. We are situated here off the northwest coast of British Columbia. Uh, we are around six to eight hours uh, ferry ride from uh, the mainland. And on a clear day, uh, we actually can see uh, Alaska uh, to the north and uh, the mainland uh, to the east. Now the location of Southland Denai, the Saving Things House, the Haida Gwaii Museum, there's a bit of a close up to show where we are situated on Haida Gwaii. Now Haida Gwaii is made up of around 150 islands that, that all together make up all, all of Haida Gwaii. Haida Gwaii is home to at least 150 towns or villages uh, that were home to the Haida nation. A major part of the Haida Gwaii Museum is the decolonization of our exhibits. Now the decolonization of exhibits uh, that came uh, to be in around the mid 2000s, I'm pretty sure we were doing this before decolonization was even coined as a word uh, within any practice. Within the Haida Gwaii Museum, we speak with the Haida voice first. The Haida language is used uh, by sharing our culture and worldview by putting forward multiple ways of knowing that empower our once nearly silenced voice. Dominant Western narratives are challenged by including Haida knowledge holders and community scholarly voices and by exploring community centered ways of knowing. Throughout our museum, Labeling and interpretation is done in Haida Kill, Haida language, first, and then in English. Elders and fluent Haida Kill speakers and the Haida or Skidigat Haida Immersion Program are consulted to provide the proper spelling and interpretation for the museum. Our Haida clans and families are also consulted if the cultural objects or treasures are noted and recorded to be originating from their specific ancestral clan or town. In our museum, our Haida treasures serve many important uses in addition to the useful museum functions of exhibit, uh, such as seen here, where we have a beautiful cedar mask of Kalkajeds on the wall and Nankilslas uh, raven this transfer, uh, transformation mass uh, hanging in the exhibit. Some of these pieces such as these are used within our traditional Haida potlatches, ceremonies, feasts, and other significant events. We work hard to make these pieces available, <coughs> excuse me, to our clans and people for special uses such as the potlatches and memorials, while maintaining our responsibility to care for these objects and maintain their security. This is a very delicate and serious matter of balancing our responsibility to conserve and preserve these objects to the standards followed by museums around the world, and also following our cultural practices and especially our wishes of our clans, elders, and our people. Our first exhibits, uh, as we go through the Haida Gwaii Museum, which I'll focus on quite a bit, is called our Supernaturals exhibit. As Haida, we come from supernatural beings that come from the ocean. Our world began thousands, tens of thousands of years ago. Our oral, oral histories tell us of these beginnings and many events that are followed, including the affairs of the notorious Raven. In this depiction here is Skulujads, this beautiful cedar uh, mask 
uh, that was created uh, by Idansu, uh, Jim Hart. In this exhibit, we tell our history of a flood and how Skulujad is tied to this flood and her name translates to Fomum. And you could see here on the right hand side of the slide is that account of the history of Skulujad. And within the exhibits, we also share our oral stories as well as our monumental arts within our frontal poles that once stood uh, at our Haida villages here. Where I am from, Kuna Ilnagai, here is a flood story that is depicted and recorded within this frontal pole. Uh, this pole fragments, which survived uh, from being in this town, is on display right beside Skulujads. They tell of the same story where we tell our stories and our histories and share it with the public and show how they're intertwined uh, together as they tell the same story of rising sea levels. Within our supernatural exhibits. Dentro de las muestras de lo sobrenatural, también contamos la historia desde el punto de vista de la ciencia. Perdón, salió una voz. En lugar, eh, les decía que también combinamos historia y ciencia. Las fusionamos para poder contar la misma historia. Nuestras historias orales y nuestra historia misma se valida a través de la ciencia o la historia valida la ciencia a su vez. Y así compartimos la tradición oral de la mujer de la espuma, por ejemplo, con la verdad científica de la inundación. Las historias de lo sobre, sobrenatural y las historias geológicas que verdaderamente ocurren, nos cuenta también cómo se fue formando la geografía del territorio, los, los icebergs. No sabemos qué tan antiguas son estos racontos históricos, pero la ciencia estudia los periodos glaciales, la geografía, la arqueología para descubrir que verdaderamente existieron esos eventos en la época preglacial en América del Norte, en esta zona de Haidawai. Y entonces el relato histórico tiene más de 15.000 años de antigüedad. Y esto habla de los Haida como nación que abandonan una región y se van más hacia el sur, al estado de Washington, o aún más al sur, donde es más caluroso, quizás a Nuevo México, Arizona, esa zona. Y por allí vivimos mucho tiempo, hasta que se dieron los glaciares y volvimos a casa. Y muchos están diciendo que existieron en Norteamérica por más de 30.000 años. O sea, que nuestros ancestros... Environmental uh, conditions that existed on Haida Gwaii. Back to indigitizing or indigenizing our practices, as mentioned, a lot of our objects are made for ceremonial use. Uh, this is Kalkajuds. Uh, this is the mask uh, that was carved, that was in the exhibit. We bring these down when potlatches and ceremonies are happening and we make them readily available. We follow normal museum practices uh, as we follow the standards by the Canadian Conservation Institute and other care and handling techniques uh, dictated to us by the BC Museums Association or the Canadians Museum Association. 
but we also make a fine balance of being able to blend our cultural practices with those con conservation techniques. And here we actively use them in ceremony and dance, uh, which they are exposed, they are in the public. And here is our potlatch uh, for my clan, the Gokyal's Kigawai Raven clan of Kuna Ilnagai. And this mask was taken down and danced over two days uh, during our potlatches usually run around 12 to 13 hours uh, every day. The masks are taken down, used by dance groups, and then they're brought back to the Haida Gwaii Museum and remounted uh, back on display. But mind you, condition reports are created before the mask leaves and when the mask comes back. So we always keep track of the condition of these beautiful objects. Okay, let's drink it back. As we go through the museum, uh, we leave the supernaturals, we leave a small exhibit, uh, which we have coined contact and conflict which I unfortunately didn't show with everyone here, but within the contact and conflict, contact and conflict, we share, it's an account of history which uh, documents our interaction with our European, uh, with the European nations from the late 1700s up until uh, the early uh, 20th century. It's more of an educational, uh, a bit of the museum. It has a lot of text, which is quite unusual as far as I've seen in other museums. And it goes through a chronological step of where we share what happens uh, on Haida Gwaii with the interaction uh, early with the Spanish and Portuguese and uh, with the Americans and the British Empire, as well as the Canadian government. But as we go leave contact and conflict, we reach uh, our grand hall, which we call keeping your way of life exhibits. This is where we really blend our hideaways uh, and museum practices together. And we really work hard on decolonizing our practices and telling the Haida story and the story of the Haida nation and our Haida people within this entire exhibit. We do our best uh, in these exhibits to show what we have on display. And our mandate is to not have stuff in storage, but to have it displayed uh, to the public. And within this gallery, we are heavy on text because we feel it necessary to explain Haida society, our matrilineal culture, our potlatch system, to the public and to the world instead of focusing on an object with a small label uh, with no cultural significance uh, tied uh, to that object. So we really want to share and explain who the Haida are, our culture and our people, and put into the really good uh, context of what we are looking at and what is on display. Here's a beautiful look, uh, looking into the pole gallery. The pole gallery is a good example of how we used our practices of what we call Haidaizing, our museum practices by raising these poles within the museum. <laughs> now, normally in museums, uh, you were, we would use a installation team uh, to raise uh, these poles. Uh, some museums, I was part of witnessing uh, a pole raising at the Humboldt Forum uh, within a cedar exhibit, and they used uh, an interesting looking crane uh, to raise the poles within the exhibit. But within South Lindenai, within this pole gallery, we got the clans and the Haida families that are direct descendants and are actually part of those families that carved those poles in Tanu Ilnagai, which is a village 
in southern Haida Gwaii, which is within Guayanas National Park. And the pole raising was done by those families alone. They set up the pole. All the ropes and cables were set up uh, for them. And it was raised with block and tackle. And we allowed, not allowed, this was, it's their property. They rose those poles within the exhibits. We already had mounts created uh, for the poles, but the clans and the families rose the poles themselves with the help of other families, which is quite unique and quite different than most uh, institutions that would have such monumental art within their exhibits. I'm going to get into some of the care and handling and changing of uh, kind of hiderizing some of our practices uh, that we have done in the past, uh, where we've seen these beautiful uh, cultural objects uh, with another institutions in the world. Uh, this beautiful uh, box drum uh, here on the right. Uh, was noted by our repatriation committee, uh, which is made up of elders, hereditary chiefs, uh, museum staff, uh, where we went around the parts of the world and were looking at collections uh, of Haida objects. And this box drum was noted at the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa, Canada. And our elders and chiefs asked if we could get this box on loan, long-term loan, uh, from the museum and put on display at the Haida Gwaii Museum, South Lindenai. Indigenizing our museum practices, our objects, our cultural treasures are not just to be sitting in a glass display case, they're living. They are not a stagnant object. The history hasn't stopped. So when this boom box, box drum came home to Haida Gwaii, as you could see here on the right, that's Guja uh, with a drumstick. We brought it out of the display case and we played it at a potlatch. And it was used at its, for its additional ed purpose, which was a drum. And it was used in multiple songs uh, throughout a potlatch ceremony. Another example of the changing of ways of how we view some of our objects, which is similar to the box drum, was this beautiful uh, chest, uh, which came from uh, my lineage of Kuna Ilnagai, where I and my ancestry comes from. It was removed in 1901, uh, brought uh, to the American Museum of Natural History. Same story as the other uh, box drum, it was noted by repatriation groups. We negotiated a, a loan so this chest could be used uh, in ceremony. And this was a beautiful balancing act of where our indigenization, our Haidaizing way of care and handling and conservation uh, really worked well with the uh, changing practices or very fluid practices of conservation with the American Muse Museum of Natural History, where our chest, we took it out of storage and display cases and brought it out into the public, uh, which is very beautiful. You could see it here sitting on a beautiful large chunk of red cedar, and it's sitting beside Chief Gdansta uh, during a two-day potlatch here. This chest was brought out to the public where people could witness it, uh, they could view it. Uh, master carvers and family uh, could be a part of it. Some people even touched it, but we made sure that people weren't touching it uh, or even like uh, picking at it because a lot of people were interested in the paint uh, that was used. But I was part, it was part of my job I was responsible for the chest and I had a very hard balancing act of following museum practices, uh, adhering to loan requirements as far as care and handling, and as well as adhering to the asks of my family and clan 
uh, about how the chest was being used. The chest was used also uh, for gift giving. Within the chest, 25 cockers were placed within this chest. Mind you, this chest has been sitting in storage for almost 100 years and putting around 300 pounds or 100 kilos or 150 kilos of copper into it was a testament to how strong and well built this chest was and gift giving was issued uh, from this chest. In the end, the chest was brought back into Southland and I within the natural histories exhibit and put back on display within a glass case as part of the loan agreements where it had to be put in a glass case. As a form of reconciliation, as part of the, the loan with this uh, moon mountain goat chest, a replica was carved by contemporary master carvers, Jolin and Gwai Edencha with Tyler York, where we were able to get a replica made of this beautiful chest. Within, within the Haida Gwai Museum, we're forever expanding our decolonizing practices. Uh, as we speak, we are working very hard on decolonizing our metadata uh, with photo archives and archival material and our decolonizing process uh, within the metadata uh, for archives is to put the Haida language first uh, in the descriptions uh, of the what's in the photos, where it is, uh, all in Haida and then in English, and also having it reviewed uh, by our elders and our language speakers. Within the Haida Gwai Museum, uh, a good part and the major part of our decolonizing efforts and indigenizing practices are held in-house and within Haida Gwai. We have a review process uh, within the Haida Gwai Museum made up of staff, uh, which is our executive director, uh, myself, repatriation coordinator, uh, collections assistants, and various museum staff and archives, where we work as a team with other museums uh, and we work on labeling and interpretation uh, of exhibit material uh, from other institutions. We also have a, what we call a deep scholarly review uh, a group also within the Haida Nation that we work with, which is made up of elders, language speakers, um, carvers, weavers, and so forth will also review our labeling and text within exhibits. This also branches out to institutions and museums around the world. Uh, both our committees uh, within the Haida Gwai Museum and our Deep Scholarly Review Committee are also, we are working with uh, labeling and interpretation and exhibits uh, design uh, with the American Museum of Natural History uh, in Manhattan, New York. Uh, we are also co-curating exhibits with the Humboldt Forum uh, in Berlin, Germany, where our groups are actively right now as we speak, reviewing text uh, and labeling and decolonizing and inputting our Haida perspective into the labeling and interpretation of the exhibit material. There's a saying that gets used uh, to end it uh, before questions is, um, I, I hope I get it right. I can't remember, it's, it's, it's an artist term. Sorry, I can't remember <laughs> what it is. So how are everybody? Uh, I hope uh, that was, is well received and I really look forward uh, to some questions. Uh, about my little uh, lecture about Southland and I uh, on our indigenization uh, practices. Thank you, Hawa, Sean. Um, for the listeners out there, uh, please feel free to add your questions in the chat in English or French or Spanish, and we will uh, make sure that they um, 
get transmitted here. Um, we've got, yeah, about 25 minutes to have a bit of a discussion. Um, I have a question to sort of <clears throat> get the ball rolling. Um, you mentioned in particular with regards to the box drum uh, that uh, you said for Haida, objects are living. Their history hasn't stopped, is what you said. And I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more about the Haida conception of objects, uh, the way that Haida um, conceive of relationships with objects, perhaps, and how that impacts your uh, museum approaches. Howard, that's a, that's a good point. That's good to elaborate on. So that comment, we brought it out mostly uh, in the early days because in museums, the depiction of our culture as other indigenous cultures in the world, it's like our cultures were in the past, uh, that we suddenly stopped or disappeared, but that's so untrue. Uh, we're still here. And by reacquainting ourselves, especially with that box drum, we are bringing it back to life, uh, so to speak. Uh, they are meant to be used. Uh, they were handcrafted by uh, the contemporary masters of the day to be used. Uh, they were never carved and created to be sitting in a glass case or in storage for that matter. They're always meant to be used. So to be able to take that box drum or even that moon mountain goat chest and use it in ceremony, we bring it back to life and the story continues uh, because the story and the history regarding that box drum didn't end uh, as originally thought when it was collected in the early or, or late uh, 19th century. It just kind of got stopped briefly. And when it got brought home with a uh, direction of the hereditary chiefs and elders, they wanted it brought out to the public. They wanted it back to life, especially with these objects being removed from Haida Gwaii. Objects like that don't exist on Haida Gwaii. There are more of our objects or cultural treasures uh, as, it speak, as it sits now, there's around 12 to 14,000 objects around the world in various collections and museums and galleries. And on Haida Gwaii, being a collections manager, we have roughly around six to 700 objects within our collection. And so it's a living object. Uh, it's meant to be used, but, but mind you to everyone that's within common sense, within its own conditioning, we wouldn't use objects that are looking very fragile. And I should always stress too, which I didn't mention in the, my talk was, we follow the guidance of, of conservators because those objects are tested to make sure there's no harmful substances as a lot of people may know or may not know. Arsenic was used, mercury was used. So we have to be very careful. Uh, so a lot of testing is done before we would handle it as we do because we're not wearing gloves. Uh, when those objects are being used in ceremony. Thank you. And then maybe as a, <clears throat> as a follow up to that question about objects, um, my, maybe my next question should be about the name Saving Things House. Um, I am, I guess that comes from the Haida language. Uh, maybe you could say a little bit more about uh, the name and how it was chosen and what that says about the museum as well. Okay, that's a good, that's a good question. So Sothland and I, which translates to Saving Things House in English. So Sothland and I was a name given to the museum by Haida elders uh, within the Skidiga community, uh, as well as the elders and language speakers at uh, our Skidigat Haida Immersion Program, because language has been a big, as people know, it's a big revitalization uh, project and a big movement going on uh, within Canada and around the world. And what we did, this is before I worked at the Haida Gwaii Museum, mind you, we would ask the elders, could you give us a name? Uh, could you give us a name that would best represents what a Haida-run museum would be called. 
and within the uh, Skiri at Haida Immersion Program, the elders sat together and created uh, unanimously that it should be called Saving Things House. Because uh, that's in essence what we're doing with the objects that we have uh, and treasures within the Haida Grand Museum, as well as the items that are being repatriated to the Haida Grand Museum. And that was their name to given to us, and we are more than happy. We're very honored that the elders gave us that name, uh, Seth Lind and I. Thank you. So I have some questions coming in from the chat. Um, I have a question from Kenya. Uh, how do you decide what to decolonize and what not to if all your collection was acquired by non-Indigenous peoples? So I guess the question is about um, when a collection has been put together from the perspective of outsiders, how do you make those choices in terms of um, uh, what to present uh, and how? I guess that, that's a good point. Uh, well, for the start, when objects or treasures were removed uh, from Haida Gwaii and either put on display in other institutions or in storage, uh, their exhibits, say they were on an exhibit, their exhibits were designed with no Haida involvement. Uh, there was no uh, Haida's consulted. Uh, this could go back to the early 20th century when a lot of these exhibits were created. They were created by uh, amateur ethnographers, anthropologists, uh, museum staff, and created these exhibits and their own interpretation uh, of the objects that were on display that were Haida. And the decolonizing process for us is now we could, we will tell you what they are uh, because they never had Haida involvement or Indigenous involvement in exhibits in the past. And that is our process of selecting these exhibits or objects and working with them and telling museums what they really are and the significance of those objects. Uh, as they are to the Haida people, which is very important uh, because there's a lot of misrepresentation within exhibits, but it's a big movement that we're noticing now in the world where they're moving towards decolonizing uh, the interpretation and their exhibits. And we're a very small museum. It looks big, but our staff is quite small and we can get inundated a lot by that ask of, could you help us decolonize our exhibits? Could you please tell us what we have? And that is what we do. We decide within our groups of what the interpretation should be. That's great, thank you. Um, I have another really good question from the chat. Have you faced difficulties with regional and national legislations regarding the relationship with the objects? Yeah, that's true, uh, absolutely. Uh, different parts uh, within the country, uh, regional and national. Uh, I think national, uh, I could speak just from what I know from, from working with uh, the federal aspect, from what I understand, it's viewed as its own by Canada. It's, it's a, the Canadian public owns these objects. Uh, within the Haida culture and the Haida community, we view that nobody owns anything. Uh, it's not owns, it's not a commodity to be owned. Uh, so that there's a simple conflict right there. It's, uh, it, goes down into ownership uh, where now a lot of times, in my opinion, uh, objects within collections are now a commodity. Uh, they're worth a lot of money, they're insured, uh, whether it's in a museum or a gallery, but there is that ownership issue where to us it's, it's Haida, uh, they're Haida objects. Uh, we view a lot of our objects were uh, unlawfully removed uh, the monumental pieces as poles is a good example. Uh, even small objects uh, were either just outrightly removed without consent or were purchased under duress, which goes into another whole subject matter of the Indian Act and the potlatch ban. 
uh, of uh, you know the 1876 and 1884. So that's that's the bit of the different uh, view it, uh, nationally, especially uh, that is. But we view it as it's it's high to objects, and we definitely like to steer away from who owns it, you know, because it is a high to object, but it is it's a hard subject uh, uh, to discuss, but we have to discuss it, that's for sure. Yeah, that's kind of why that was my first question to, to, to think about what is the Haida understanding of a relationship with an object, um, because sometimes in certain cultures, the relationship to the object is that a person owns something or an institution owns something, it's a relationship of ownership, Whereas here, I think we're talking about a broader definition of relationality with with uh, museum collections. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I have another question about uh, specifically about your example of the chest uh, and the fact that the uh, community members uh, were very curious about the painting that was used. Uh, is there any reason for, for specific cultural reason for that? Um, what kind of paint was used, and are there are they pigments that still exist? Yeah, that's an excellent question. That's so important. Uh, for one, we we don't have objects like that in our collection, so it was a, a very interesting to the general public, as well as master carvers and artists uh, of today. And the paint, I brought up the paint because there, there, were, there are organic paints, natural paints uh, that our ancestors used uh, to paint. Um, charcoal uh, for black, we had ochre. There's a similar um, mineral, um, uh, kind of like ochre, that could be used as green as well as crushed abalone shell. So the curiosity came into, is it natural pigments uh, or is it traded pigments? And by the curiosity, I, I think one of the first contemporary master carvers, I think it may have been Christian White, uh, poked at it. And or it might have been Gujao, uh, who was for the potlatch, had a look and he goes, oh, wow, there's mica infused in the paint. And so we knew that the, the green paint was a traded paint, and it also helps put it into a time frame of when the Haida nation was trading uh, with uh, our European uh, friends who were trading as well as the Americans, so we could figure out a time frame in the early to mid 19th century when these paints were traded. So right away by people being interested in the paint, we easily were able to tell and tell the public that this uh, beautiful chest was painted with traded paint, uh, and it definitely sits within the mid 19th century periods of when it was painted. That's very interesting, and it really also shows the value of, uh, as you said, bringing on skilled craftspeople and uh, practitioners of uh, of traditional arts uh, to look at the objects and and yeah. uh, give their give their opinions and assessments. <clears throat> so it even goes a bit deeper when the chest showed up uh, in the museum, it was unpacked the, the day before the potlatch. It was in all reporting, it was recorded as a red cedar chest. It didn't take myself and master carvers who were there no more than about five minutes to realize that the chest is made out of yellow cedar as well as red cedar. And it took us that short period of time to inform our, our friends from the Museum of Natural History in Manhattan that actually the, all the panels are yellow cedar, the lid and the bottom are red cedar, but the actual chest is, is carved out of yellow cedar. And that our knowledge is so key to like really help figure out like what it's made out of and how it was used. Absolutely. Um... So I have another question about um, the relationship between the museum and academia. Uh, do you think that there's a link between academic discussions uh, and the reality of a museum like yours that is going through these processes of Haidaization or decolonization? Oh, absolutely. There's a link. 
I'm an archaeologist by academic trade, so we 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 blend the two uh, and make sure we blend the two wherever possible. Uh, with archaeology, we use our nerdery, as I call it, for with our carbon dating, our time frames uh, that we use, the technology, and we blend it uh, really well uh, with our Haida histories, our oral stories, and we put it all together so we tell the same story, uh, as well as I, I, I used the example of the geology, uh, climate change, uh, as well with our oral histories, and we blend them to do, uh, together. Braiding of ways or two-eyed seeing gets used in some academic worlds, and we we want to blend them together. And because in the past, I've noticed uh, as an archaeologist, it was more of a conflict uh, when I was working in the 1990s, where there was not a lot of interest in the academia part to incorporate oral histories into say the report writing or the interpretation of cultural uh, significance. But at uh, South Linda and I, we, we blend them together. So they tell the same story uh, in a different way, but they tell the same story. And we make sure they're used together wherever we can, uh, whether it's high to language with the science or by blending the science and oral histories together. Um, I guess that uh, that brings me to, uh, since you mentioned how things were before in the 90s, uh, there is a question about what you think colonialism, a, a sort of colonial approach in museums looks like. How, how, it is, how is it characterized? Um, and uh, we have eight minutes left, so okay. uh, uh just keep keep that in <laughs> keep that in mind and i mean i think we've had a really good uh example of what a sort of uh, decolonial museum is like here so maybe yeah. feel free to be as brief as you like <laughs> yeah absolutely so the a colonial exhibit or colonial say museum I, i've traveled around uh, i got to see different exhibits or even to see them virtually um those exhibits didn't have any indigenous involvement. Uh, so a very colonial exhibit in my mind, uh, I, I could use um, uh, uh, even the Canadian Museum of History, uh, American Museum of Natural History, uh, other institutions uh, that had old exhibits. Uh, the Hall of North American Indians is a good example at AMNH in Manhattan. No, those exhibits were beautiful, like they had objects on display. You know, the, the interpretation and labeling was very colonial. The, it was uh, an ethnographer and a curator uh, making labels uh, about a culture and a people and about objects with no inputs uh, from the indigenous people, uh, whether it was Haida or Thlinkit or other indigenous people. So in my mind, in short, a colonial exhibit is usually an exhibit within an institution that had no input at all from indigenous community, uh, which is just how it was back then. Uh, times have changed, but that's just the, the normal practice. And a lot of those exhibits were so old. You know, the interpretation was done in the early 20th century to the mid 20th century. And at best museums were cleaning and maybe updating, you know, the panels or so forth. But the interpretation was done by a, a different generation of people. And to me, that's a colonial exhibit, uh, in short, which, like I said, had no indigenous input uh, at all uh, within the interpretation. Yeah, so it's more of a, I think that's a good way of summing it up. It's more of a, an approach um, and a methodology than anything specifically to do with the content itself. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just the way it was uh, in the past. And now we're just moving forwards and uh, some are very proactive to move with it. Some are a bit slower, but you know, everything's changing, which is great. And it's a fun process. Yeah. Um, yeah, speaking of uh, fun, <laughs> um, there's a question also about the involvement of youth. 
um, okay. and how uh, new generations, younger generations are involved and motivated to contribute to uh, the museum and the, the processes of uh, safeguarding living, living heritage and, and the museum. That's great. Well, that's a good point. We, that's, we have the youth involved as we speak uh, all year round. Uh, we have at least two, two to four uh, youth uh, involved in working in the museum. We, they're, they're high school students, usually uh, anywhere from say 15, 16 year olds and older. And we immerse them in museum practices. They work in archives, they work with me in collections. Uh, they'll help in exhibits, uh, uh, maintenance, exhibit creation. Uh, they'll work in galleries uh, with museum staff, uh, even work in lab uh, conservation. So we will fully immerse, uh, uh, we call them like youth interns uh, within the museum. Uh, in the fall time, we have two. Summer, we may have more, depending on funding. We seek out youth funding uh, to make sure we, we draw in youth to get interested in working in the museum and, and be this part of, the, a part of the culture, finding more youth to, to follow and just to be, to be a part of it. Uh, we also have uh, school groups come into the South Linden Eye, uh, different age groups, anywhere from kindergarten up to uh, high school uh, with different projects uh, that they come in and we have them engaged. Uh, we give tours, interpretation. We bring collection objects out. Uh, we blend it with their school programming, uh, with our collection uh, items that we have. So we're always uh, actively trying to get the youth to come to the museum, especially the schools. Uh, the Hyadigwai Museum, right now, we're, we're actually working on curriculum uh, for our local school district to help have the museum part of Haida studies and just Haida Gwai studies in general uh, of using the Haida Gwai Museum's collection and having the youth involved in learning from what we have in the museum instead of coming in for like a day or like a class but we could be uh, politely used uh, for our resources for for the youth and education. That's great. And uh, we heard uh, from your presentation as well that elders, on the other hand, are also really involved in, in the work of the museum. So there's a, there, every, everyone's involved. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the elders come in frequently throughout the year and they keep us on our toes. Uh, they will look at our labeling uh, and our interpretation, uh, our panels. And sometimes they'll inform us that's wrong. You have the wrong name and you need to change it. And we do it right away. Because <laughs> in our culture, when an elder tells you to do something, you do it right away. <laughs> so, so having elders come through kind of like our quality control uh, in, in a way that they could review stuff that we're doing and make sure that we're using the appropriate language and interpretation. Right. Um, so we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I think I'm just going to permit myself one final question, uh, because you gave us a little teaser about the Humboldt Forum uh, raising of the polls. Um, yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, how that relationship uh, came about, uh, how that exhibit has uh, has come about and and um, what's going on there. So the, the Humboldt Forum in Berlin uh, contacted the Heidegger Museum, Southland and I, about a cedar exhibit. Uh, they were wanting to create a new exhibit uh, within the Humboldt Forum, which is quite huge from my understanding, uh, looking at what they're doing. And they really wanted to reach out to see if we would be willing uh, to partake and help create an exhibit with them, like co-curate an exhibit. And it was a great idea and it was, we're really happy because usually we are contacted after an exhibit is created and we get to work on maybe the labeling and interpretation after it's been designed. But the Humboldt Forum uh, asked us to work together on the design uh, of the exhibit right from the get-go, uh, uh, which was great. And that 
drew me into a whole different learning curve on curation and designing an exhibit. And they branched out into wanting to explore cedar instead of focusing on cultural objects like poles or spoons or baskets. They wanted to focus on something that was so integral to our culture of the Haida culture, as well as other Northwest Coast cultures in British Columbia, Canada, which was red cedar. So they wanted to start an exhibit to explore the importance of red cedar and go through the importance of how it fits into different aspects of our cultures, which was great because it focuses on the culture and the cedar as much as the objects. And instead of focusing on objects, it was about cedar and it was great. And there's a lot of engagement with uh, the public, uh, especially with that pole raising, which was a virtual pole raising obviously in the Humboldt form, which I mentioned, they use this cool robot like this crane. And that's how it came to be. It was just a communication uh, from staff because they met uh, my executive director, uh, just Gung, Nika Collison at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. And that's how the, the relationship started. And they're like, hey, do you wanna work on it with us? And we're like, absolutely. And right now we're, hoping we could open our exhibit sounds like september of 2022 for our cedar exhibit within the humboldt forum great um all right well that brings us to uh to the time that we have for today uh sean do you have any sort of final final thoughts or parting remarks for uh for the group uh well how about for entertaining me uh this morning <laughs> And uh, it, it was great. Uh, I, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And how was so much for asking me to uh, do a presentation on our Heidi Gwai Museum? How about to you as well for taking the time and effort to uh, present uh, today? I know it's also very early in the morning for you, so uh, it's very much appreciated. Uh, before we go, I would really like to thank our interpreters today in Spanish and French. Uh, so some virtual rounds of applause for the interpreters. Uh, and also to my colleagues at ICOM for helping with all of the logistics and everything in the background to bring our webinar about. Uh, and finally, uh, to all of the participants who joined and who had such ex excellent questions. Uh, so a round of applause for everybody. Uh, and finally, uh, I just want to take the opportunity to uh, inform or remind everybody that uh, if you would like to know more about decolonization and museums, uh, ICOM has actually just put out its first MOOC, uh, Massive Open Online Course. Uh, there, is a there is a module in the MOOC on decolonization, uh, even though it uh, focuses more on inclusion. Uh, but uh, just wanted to put that out there in case uh, some participants today would be interested. Uh, my colleague has just uh, shared the link in the chat on Zoom, but you can find more information about it on our website. And uh, also, if you'd like more information about the Haida Gwaii Museum, uh, they have a fantastic website as well. So uh, with that, Sean, I wish you a wonderful day on Haida Gwaii. Thank you so much. And uh, a good evening and rest of the day to everybody else. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hopefully see people in Europe for the Humboldt Forum Open next September. That would be that would be great. <laughs> bye bye everybody. Bye bye. So much.